Sil pressured me into giving my brother my house, but I rented it out to friends. I did get a few cameras for my house, including a ring doorbell in front. I didn't tell my family about the cameras, just in case, but thus far, no one has attempted a break-in. I think the way I outed them all before scared them into leaving me alone. For the most part anyway, I've taken to renting out two of the rooms in my house. One to a close friend, the other to a friend of said close friend. Both have been fantastic tenants. They know to keep quiet and leave me alone most of the time. They even have small refrigerators they keep in their rooms, so they don't need to keep any of their drinks in the main fridge. The deal I gave them on rent was too good for them to pass up. It increased my monthly income well. And even after taxes, I'm still putting some decent amounts in the bank since the rent money pays a good chunk of my monthly mortgage. You're all probably wondering how my parents, brother, and Sil took to me renting out those rooms to friends. Well, the answer is not well. My father and Dan stayed out of it, but Sil freaked out, which made my mother come crying to me over how I could have rented those rooms to Dan and his family instead. We had a bit of an argument in which I pointed out one thing. They broke into my house before trying to steal it. She wouldn't want to let someone who did that move in with her. Also, there wasn't enough room for me, Dan, and his entire family in my house. Not that I'd ever share a roof with them anyway. It's a three bedroom, no less manufactured home. I have a master bedroom, and it's adjoining the bathroom. That would have left only two small rooms for Dan, Sil, and four kids. Not to mention, they'd be annoying to me all the time. Also, she knows very well that I can't be around Sil because she intentionally antagonizes me. And they all mocked me when I was homeless before. Besides, my current tenants are both single guys in their 30s that I get along with. My mother had some sobbing excuses for a while, but she finally let it go and admitted she was just desperate. Parents found out I was renting rooms out because Sil basically stalked me in some way. Then she told my parents, and then my parents contacted me. And then my mother came over to cry about it. Since then, my parents haven't bothered me once about the house. So things are good for me. My parents and Dan, not so much. It turns out Sil is a far worse person than even I thought. I already knew she was a gaslighting, self-victimizing drama queen, but she sank even lower. Dan's youngest child turned out not to be his. Yeah, you all read that correctly. Sil had an affair, which, in retrospect, isn't all that surprising. And something a few people here totally called months ago. After being caught, Sil was ousted from the family. Dan just recently finished his divorce, which actually went in his favor since we thankfully live in an at-fault state. Dan also sued to get his name taken off the birth certificate of the youngest child and won. Basically, after the incident where my parents tried to force me to hand over my house, things got pretty tumultuous at their house. Sil blamed me a lot. She was somehow convinced that I had tons of money, like I'd won the lottery or something and that I should share the wealth. Apparently it was her idea that they come to my Christmas party because she hoped they could all try to get on my good side. It was also her idea to make my parents and Dan try to get money from me for an apartment. So it really burst her bubble when Dan and my parents informed her of how my finances actually were. For the longest time, she had Dan and my parents fully engulfed in her toxic mindset and only fed their narcissism with her own. So her blaming me made the rest of them blame me. That is, until what happened in front of the police when they tried to steal my house. That's when the downfall of Sil really started. My parents and Dan were apprehensive about coming to my Christmas party after the way I doubted them. But Sil convinced them to just throw together a few cheap gifts from what they could get at the last minute and just show up, because he'd never throw us out once we're already there. Boy, was she wrong. She gambled on that plan. And I, with the complete blessings of everyone I'd invited, threw her and the rest of them out. Her plan, which she no doubt thought was the most clever thing ever, backfired spectacularly in her face. I guess being chewed out by family at my party not only wrecked my parents' reputation even more, it actually started a wake-up call for them to eventually not listen to Syl anymore. And as I said in my last post, my parents decided on going back to church. Perhaps because last year I'd said they'd probably go to hell for their actions. I can't say that's the real reason. But you have to admit, it would feel kind of satisfying if that were the case. Though my parents hadn't been to church in two decades before going back, I don't think it's a bad idea that they're going to church. They need to understand that going doesn't just give them a do-over for all the things they've done in the past, but I have a little faith they're at least trying. Because my parents came to my house without Dan to personally apologize to me after they'd seen an animated video of my first three posts. That's right, they've known about this Reddit account for a long time now. They also know everything I'm saying. Yes. They're unhappy about it, but I feel everyone here deserves an update since it's anonymous. For my parents and Dan, though, watching an animated video of themselves and their own actions was a great way to make them see what kind of people they really are. And they came over to apologize to me later. I'd never seen my father apologize like that to anyone. And the man isn't a good actor. So this felt genuine. They fully acknowledged what they did to me, 
and there's no excuse for any of it. They even described themselves as narcissists and admitted the truth that they had wronged me very badly. Then they went on to blame Syl for a lot of things. Yeah, they kind of threw her under the bus, but it's not like she wasn't guilty of everything they said. My parents had been getting counseling for a while now too, and they do offer group family counseling, but I declined, as I'm not ready for that anytime soon. Dan himself didn't apologize to me for some time, but he looked extremely remorseful any time the past was brought up. Meanwhile, Dan and Sill's marriage absolutely fell apart. It wasn't a crumble, it was a cascade. Without me as the black sheep or ATM that they couldn't mock or try to get money from anymore. Sill finally let out enough of her toxic attitude toward Dan and my parents for them to realize she's not the person they thought she was. Their denial had been strong, but Sill's entitlement was stronger. I've had many thoughts of lightsabers clashing over this drama. Sill clad like a bimbo with a lightsaber that looks like a giant lipstick, or something like that. I imagine there's a wealth of puns and jokes to be had there but I really didn't bother to think much more in detail about it. But, as you can imagine, things only got worse because Syl kept looking for other ways to get what she wanted. She kept bringing up ads for used campers and RVs to try and get my parents to buy one to live out of so they could have the main house. And she kept doing this, no matter how many times they told her to stop. She even tried to say my parents should just buy an RV and have a life on the road, like normal old people do. That was stupid, even for Syl. The opposite was suggested by my parents. Dan and Syl buy a camper themselves to live out of it instead. Syl basically said she shouldn't have to do that since she's the mom. She pretty much lorded the fact that she thought she had total parental authority over everyone's heads because the kids in the house were all hers. And when Syl didn't get her way, she actually took her baby and left the house to disappear for several days. They knew she was fine because her phone was still working and she was responding to texts with short but passive aggressive answers. And when she came back, she was only more embittered because nobody caved to her demands while she was away. Syl also refused to go to church, but Dan went with her parents and took his kids along as well, save for the youngest, since Syl refused to let him take the baby anywhere. Personally, I don't go to church. I believe in God and all that stuff, but I just don't like church. Besides, it never did me any good growing up. Syl pressured me into giving my brother my house, but I rented it out to friends update one. Problem happened when Dan suddenly called out his wife as a cheater. March. This shocked us all because we thought he was a complete pushover for her. But no, he's not. At least not anymore. You all know how he treated me when I was on his bad side. Well, his wife wasn't spared that hire at all. He started putting pieces together about her deceit after finally pulling his head out of his ass and secretly getting DNA tests for all his kids. Three of the kids are his, but the youngest one, the baby, was not. For the record, Dan and I both have pretty dark, straight hair that's almost black. Same with our parents. Syl's hair is straight and pretty dark, too, but the baby's hair is lighter and a bit curly. At first, Dan just thought it was because of the baby's age. Syl kept playing it off and said that it would darken in time but the baby's hair never got darker. I guess that was Dan's biggest clue. He confronted his wife with the DNA results in front of our parents, and she broke down, sobbing, saying that it was a mistake. So pulled out all the Darvo stops of denying, trickle-truthing, and gaslighting. But Dan had none of it and had actually done more to find out about her affair than I would have ever thought. I knew he was smart. He just let himself be dumb. He had detailed proof of her cheating with phone records, texts he got off her phone, bank records, and the DNA test. He even identified the man she's cheating with, who is likely the father since he has much lighter, curly hair. The evidence against her was crystal clear, and Dan said she was so bad at hiding her affair. He didn't even have a hard time figuring any of it out once he started looking. My parents demanded that she leave their house immediately. That's when she went psycho on them all, first in just yelling, but she quickly got physical. The police had to be called by my mother, and yeah. Syl was arrested. She scratched up Dan and my father quite a bit with her long fake nails. And she even harmed her eldest kid in the crossfire by hitting him hard enough to have a black eye and nosebleed when he tried to intervene. Dan was smart enough to have his phone recording nearby when he confronted her. So the police had all they needed to arrest her for assault. Syl's parents had to drive over to bail her out. Then they came back for the baby, Syl's stuff, and her car as well. A couple days after Syl got bailed out. She showed up at my house because I was apparently next on her list. As soon as I opened the door, she went on a delusional rant where she said I was the entitled bane of her existence. I'm not sure, but I think she might have been high on something, because this felt extra crazy for her, and her eyes didn't look right. She claimed mothers with young children are the most sacred thing in the world. Then she went on, yelling that giving up my house shouldn't have been too much to ask for, because supporting the family was the least I could have done. And if I had, then her family would still be together. When I tried to talk while she was spewing all that out, she actually attempted to shove me and cover my mouth. She even had her hand poised, like she was ready to scratch me. Well, 
that went about as well with me as you can expect. I'm not exactly one to be threatened, and I told her I'd call the police if she didn't take her hands off me right that moment. I also told her I'd got it all on my doorbell camera. She started panicking the moment she heard camera. Then I ended up verbally savaging her to the point where she was backing off my porch. I told her she had some gall to call me entitled when she's exactly that. She didn't work for anything she had anymore. She cheated on her husband and got pregnant with her affair partner. She made my mother do most of the parenting for her children, spent Dan's money till they were in the financial hole, and acted entitled to my home to the point of trying to steal it. I called her ex-1000, and she's a greedy chick who is blinded by narcissism. Then I told her to stop blaming me for her own actions and to never show up at my house again. Being told all that was pretty much all she'll needed to hear before jumping back into her car, then peeled out and sped off. This was finally the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Now that she was separated from Dan, I ended up finally going to the police and filing a report on her for harassment and the assault she'd done on me last year. I put her hands on me on my front porch only to add to it. The police have it all on record now. And I gave copies of the video to Dan for his divorce lawyer. And yes, I did file for a restraining order against Sill. It was easily granted because it was obvious that the woman was unhinged. She's not made a social media post about me since I could see it. But that's just because she kept her profile private. I hope her blame ship against me has long since sailed. Either way, she's left me alone. Sill was still with her affair partner during the divorce. At the time, I had no real idea what kind of man he was. But any person who monkeys with someone else's spouse and even has a child with them really doesn't have a lot of morals to begin with. Once the divorce was underway, Sill admitted that Dan just wasn't man enough for her anymore because he couldn't afford to give her the lifestyle she wanted. She actually believed herself to be on the level of a trophy wife and that she deserved to be with someone wealthy. Dan said he pulled Amy and maniacally laughed at her. He said she was nowhere near hot enough to be a trophy wife along with mentioning any other faults she had. Sill ended up humiliated by this and ran off like a child. Due to having to live with her parents, Sill was forced to work in their family business because Dan wasn't giving her access to his bank accounts anymore. She'd already maxed out all the credit cards he had previously given her, and she griped about having to work for her parents despite having a college degree. But I think they were the only ones who'd employ her anyway since she's got a criminal record and a decade-long gap in her resume. I've heard from Dan that her parents were severely disappointed in her as well. But that was just a rumor. They could be just as bad as her, for all I know. Either way, the show The Divorce really took off once it got going. Syl didn't walk away with much from it, especially because she had an affair and physically hurt her Phil, husband, and eldest child, and it's in a fault state like I mentioned earlier, so she kissed any chance of getting her way goodbye. Dan's lawyer pulled some strings to get the divorce started as fast as possible, but it cost him. I don't know the more specific details or how much it all cost. They never told me. Sill, on the other hand, was financially backed into a corner very badly. And you know what can happen when you corner an animal. She fought back, but the law was not on her side nor were her dwindling finances. Sill's parents had to pay for a lawyer for her, and not a very good one either. Also, she actually brought her affair partner to the divorce court to testify on her behalf. This guy was a real piece of work. He had a bronze tongue and a charming smile, which he tried to use to his advantage. He claimed Sill had been wronged by an incompetent husband, which is why she sought the arms of another man. He claimed he was ready to take responsibility for the child he had fathered with Sill, but that Sill would still need the alimony to help support herself and care for said child. He remarked that, because Dan was still on the birth certificate at the time, alimony should be one of his obligations. Dan said this guy used big words and a charming smile but seemed an extra special kind of stupid. And coming from Dan, that's saying something. The judge was also not swayed in the slightest and told the bronze tongue that he was a hypocrite for saying he was ready to take responsibility for his own child, while also holding his hand out for money from the man whose marriage he'd helped ruin. That shut him up. Dan was prepared to sue his wife's affair partner for alienation of affection too. However, that fell through. I guess it would have been on Dan to prove how much she'd loved him before the affair started. But after her mask came off and we saw the real her, we're not sure if she ever really loved him at all or if she just loved having a meal ticket. Someone here pointed out that Syl probably kept popping out kids to avoid getting a job. And you may have been right. Either way, Syl tried dragging out the divorce, but Dan's lawyer and the judge kept that from happening much. I swear, Dan must have seriously lucked out because he was one of the meanest and most unsympathetic judges in the state. And all the evidence we had on Syl made it easy to keep her from playing the victim. So instead, she just let her real, selfish self out since there was no point in hiding it anymore. The court had all of the records provided by Dan and myself, police reports, photos, and recordings, to prove she was an abusive narcissist. There was a mountain against Syl that she had no way to climb over or hike around. She tried standing against the mountain, but that was prime avalanche territory.
Sil pressured me into giving my brother my house, but I rented it out to friends update too. At the end of the divorce, Sil struck a deal to end things quickly. Dan takes three quarters of the credit card debt and gets his name off the baby's birth certificate. Sil walks away with only partial custody of her children and no alimony, but also without most of the credit debts she racked up. Her being legally employed by her parents meant she had an income of her own to fall back on to start paying off her debts. She can see her other kids almost whenever she wants and can take them on weekends. But for whatever reason, he has made very few attempts to even see them. She took them out to eat fast food a few times, but she never took them home with her. The kids are back in school now, so that gives her even fewer opportunities to see them. You'd think her parents would want to see their grandchildren, but they haven't contacted Dan about it. They barely saw Dan's children before that. Too. Now they may not even bother to see them at all. Do they hate kids or something? Even Dan doesn't know, but he tells me that his in-laws were always indifferent to him. As for Dan, well, he really did love his wife a lot, so the betrayal of her cheating made him hit the bottle hard. Rewind back to the night of his confrontation with his wife. He came to me in a stupor with a whiskey bottle in hand and his face all scratched up and covered in bandages. I wouldn't say he was drunk yet, but I freaked out seeing him look like that at first then berated him for driving under the influence. But that didn't really mean much to him compared to the betrayal of his cheating harlot by a soon-to-be ex-wife. We spent a few hours hanging out in my camper so as not to disturb my tenants. All the while, Dan was drinking whiskey straight from the bottle and crying that he's a fool. And how he regretted ever marrying Sill. Pretty much any time he mentions her now, he just refers to her as that chick. So that's ex Sill's nickname now. Ironically, this time together was the most bonding Dan and I have done in 15 years. While he didn't exactly apologize to me, he called himself a human being with terrible taste in women. Then he said I, at least, didn't make his mistakes. Despite all he previously did to me, he's still my younger brother. And I couldn't risk letting him try to drive home. So I told him to stay the night and managed to take his keys. Then I set up the bunk in my camper for him to use. I rented out my spare rooms after all. He was in no shape to drive home. And if he'd taken an Uber, He'd have to pay for it and then have to come back for his car later. He was still a depressed, crying mess, and he didn't want our parents or his kids to see him like that. And frankly, I was worried he'd do something insanely stupid if I let him leave. I didn't want him to sleep in the house, so putting him in the camper was the best option. Just because that rat fucked him over doesn't mean I suddenly trusted him. So it would be better for him to sleep it off in the camper. We both spent time in the camp playing games and watching movies on my portable DVD player. Poker was no fun with just two people and the old maid was just boring. Thankfully, I had an Uno Deck 2 and an old school battleship game. He really liked those. It was enough to keep him distracted until he was finally willing to lay down after running out of whiskey. He threw up a lot of it in a bucket anyway, but he was not opposed to sleeping in my camper. In fact, he found the idea kind of cool. Dan had a lot of questions for me as to how I lived in the camper for as long as I did, and I answered them all, if not just to keep him busy but I needed to go to bed myself since I had to be up early, so I left him with my portable DVD player and a couple of movies. That way, he could amuse himself alone for a while, if he even managed to stay awake. Before leaving for work in the morning, I popped in while Dan was passed out in the bunk. I left a bottle of ibuprofen and an energy drink on the counter of the camper's kitchenette, along with his car keys and a letter explaining to leave through the backyard gate. He saw himself out without trouble around 1.30 p.m. About a month after ex Sil was kicked out, Dan came to me, asking to borrow my camper. I guess he found it more comfortable than I'd thought when he slept in it. And he fully admitted that he didn't ask sooner out of pride, but with his soon-to-be ex-wife out of the house, he'd decided to give up his room for his eldest child. He's got two girls and a boy, with the boy being the eldest, and he's now eight years old. The kids were all forced to share a room until that point. They just had curtains up for the boy's half of the room, but the boy often slept on the couch to avoid his sisters. I know the poor kid was really desperate for his own room, so, I guess Dan decided to finally make a better decision as a dad and came to see me in order to beg to borrow my camper so his son could have his room. If he could have afforded it, he'd have bought his own camper instead of relying on me. And I even said as much. I hadn't even gotten the chance to use the camper for actual camping yet, but I caved and let him use it since it was actually for a good cause, and he promised to buy his own in time anyway. I didn't ask for rent money for the camper. Dan is in enough of a financial hole as it is right now. ex Sil and the divorce drained him, and I've learned that I get far better results with family later by not being spiteful. I loaded my camper up and put it down in my parents' backyard. And my father put in a 30 amp breaker so it'll have enough power for Dan to run heat and AC when he needs it. I do miss the camper. After all that time living in it, it kind of felt like it was a part of me. But the only reason I loaned it out was for the sake of Dan's kids. Pretty much the only reason I still do anything for my parents or Dan is for the sake of those kids, as I've bonded with them. And yes, 
I know I may not get the camper back for quite some time, and likely not in the kind of condition I landed out in, but I've warned Dan and my parents that they will be financially responsible for any damage they do to the camper, as well as its upkeep, for as long as they have it. I also took many time stamped pictures and videos of the camper inside and outside before lending it out, so I can prove its condition before it leaves. Dan even recorded a video with me agreeing to my terms, so that's as good as a contract. With the financial drain of the divorce, Dan's not going to be able to get a place of his own for years, I'll bet. Though he seems to have no complaints about living in the camper, I don't know if he actually likes it or if he's just putting up a front, but I can guess it reminds him of the backyard forts we had as kids, since that's how it felt with me sometimes. Either way, he's living in it now. I did get some major props from the extended family for letting him borrow them too. I'm now referred to by a lot of them as the good brother Dan doesn't deserve. Either way, I think getting rid of Syl was a great first step in mending the family as a whole. I still have little care for my brother and parents after the way they treated me all my life, but I'm not going to let Dan's kids suffer for it. Those kids have actually really warmed up to me. They're actually happy to see me when I come over or when they visit me. I've even babysat a few times. Now that they don't have their toxic mother around, they've become much nicer kids, especially to me. I'm actually getting to enjoy being an uncle now. My mother is still doing the bulk of the parenting for my siblings, and she's been acting as nice as possible to stay on my good side. My father often looks very defeated in my presence, but otherwise, he's been either stoically quiet or just generally nice to me but he won't talk to me much. Though that's leagues better than how he was before, at least. I'm not letting my guard down either way. My parents do seem more happy that my ex still is gone, and they often say they don't know what they ever saw in her, my mother especially, because the two of them butted heads over who was mom in the house for a long time. At the same time as the divorce, Dan sued to have his name removed from the birth certificate of the baby that wasn't his. The chick didn't really want to change it because it meant no more child support from Dan if she did. However, there was a court-ordered paternity test for the man identified as the baby's father. I was prepared to laugh in case it turned out he wasn't the father either, but he was. Dan's lawyer had a long talk with the ex Sil's lawyer. ex Sil had no leg to stand on, and Dan was ready to go to bat to make her situation even worse. She didn't have the finances to fight him any longer and agreed to change the birth certificate. The bronze-tongued lout who'd knocked her up did man up to take financial responsibility as a parent but he ended up not staying with Syl. He contacted Dan through his lawyer to tell him he'd broken up with that chick and that he wouldn't bother him again. This may be the end. Ex Syl is out of our hair. My parents and brother have finally made a real effort to be better people. I'm surprisingly happy as an uncle, and my house is still my house.